Can you explain just your book? You spent a lot of time explaining all the logistics and, you know, what was needed to get the supplies through France and from England and everything like that. Can you um, just explain some of that, like how, how people went about planning it? Okay. Well, the decision to meet finally is taken in uh, late 1519 that is going to happen in the summer of 1520. But actually, they've been planning it for about 18 months beforehand because originally the two kings were going to meet a year earlier. And at that time, Wolsey starts drawing up um, regulations. He publishes um, a, a sort of pronouncement in which he more or less says, these are the following things that are going to happen. These are all the people who are going to go to this event. Um, this is where you have to be by such and such a date. And he sends these letters out to throughout the kingdom, only one of which actually survives, which is very lucky because it gives us the text of, of what um, lots and lots of gentry and nobles would have had, basically saying, you should turn up with a retinue, dress splendidly, um, at such and such a date at Dover or wherever, um, ready to be going to Europe. At the same time, Wolsey orders through the royal court to buy up wheat and cattle uh, and uh, all, all the things that are needed, food, sheep, um, <laughs> anything and everything, um, which are all to be assembled um, at the port of Dover um, by late May uh, 1520. Um, and then he also organises shipping. Um, so he gets the Lord Warden of the Sank Ports and various other naval officials and commanders to either buy or hire several, in the end, several hundred ships or, or vessels, barges, to take a lot of this stuff across from England, across to the English colony as Calais, because uh, the meeting takes place um, not very far away from Calais. It, it's technically on English territory within the, the so-called Pale of Calais, the town, between the town of Guine, which is controlled by the English, and Ardre, which is a French town. And so it's technically English territory uh, on which all this happens. Um, he also sends out orders to the garrison, of, the Tudor garrison at Calais, to go and buy uh, more materials, um, horses, uh, sheep, and all the rest of it, sort of food-wise, um, uh, to, to bring uh, for this event. At the same time, uh, they start in England building what becomes known as the Crystal Palace, that is, the, the temporary palace made of wood and glass and canvas, um, which which is where Henry and Wolsey entertain their French counterparts during the, the Field of Cloth of Gold. And it's built, it's, it's sort of framed up um, in, it's a bit like putting together like a piece of Ikea um, uh, furniture. <laughs> so you build all the bits and then you ship it across um, to uh, the Pale of Calais and then you put it together um, uh, in a flat pack with screwdrivers and all the rest of it. You put that together over the course of a couple of months, just immediately prior to the event. I mean, it is still astonishing um, how how they managed to do that. Um, if your listeners can imagine something like a, an Oxford or Cambridge University college where there's a quadrangle in the middle with buildings around either side, or if you know, in the Hampton Court Palace, that that temporary palace was about as big um, as as one of those. So it 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 really was an astonishing feat of of uh, carpentry and technology transportation to get this over. Um, they buy glass um, in the Netherlands uh, and in other places around because glass is not yet being made to a sufficiently high quality in England. So they buy it on the continent, um, and they, it just costs, in our terms, millions. Um, it's a bit like, in the book I make reference to the, the uh, Olympics in 2008 in Beijing, that extraordinary the Bird's Nest Stadium, which the main stadium, which was the biggest and grandest, and, and people were impressed by its scale and size. Well, something very similar is happening um, for the English. Um, French, the French king doesn't have a palace of the same size, but what he has is a whole series of huge tented pavilions, um, which um, he builds just outside the town of Ardre, 
and they are gigantic in size and covered in the most incredibly expensive material. So they're basically canvas, but they're covered over in silk, uh, in velvet, um, all with fleur-de-lis and gold and silver. Um, it must have looked, probably to our eyes, it looked a bit kind of blingy, really, because it would have been quite brash. But um, it's the scale of everything, and that's what's important about this event, because whatever the reasons for it and whatever the, the, the diplomacy and the politics of it, what it's really about is two kings demonstrating to each other, not by warfare, but by spectacular uh, peace, their, their demonstrative power. If I can do this, get all this, you know, out, millions in our terms of materials together, if I can bring 6,000 people with me, uh, which is the size of a, of a late medieval army anyway, uh, if I can bring all these things together and entertain you for two weeks just because we're declaring a peace between us, imagine what I can do to you if you break this peace. That's the message of the Field of Cloth of Gold. That's what both sides are doing. Um, and if you play by the rules, then I will play by the rules, and we can be peaceful and friendly. If you don't, then this, you know, imagine what I will do with you if I am, you know, being serious.